Welcome everyone. My name is Cesar Rodriguez Garavito, and I'm the chair of the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice at New York University uh, School of Law, and um, also at the uh, Climate Litigation Accelerator. As some of you know, we host uh, monthly webinars that CLX curates to bring uh, important new cases, new reports, new ideas to uh, climate litigants and researchers. Um, and uh, uh, today we will be focusing on a case that I'll describe in a moment that's particularly exciting um, and that we're very pleased to uh, host a conversation on. Uh, but I wanted to say uh, uh, something very quickly about our next two events, because I think that the CLX um, uh, community of practice will find them particularly uh, helpful. So we will be hosting an event uh, discussing the implications of the recent or this week's IPCC report, which, uh, as uh, you all know, focused squarely on the um, distributional implications of climate change, meaning uh, the impacts uh, in the global south on um, vulnerable communities around the world, and this intersection between climate uh, trends and socioeconomic trends is at the heart of what climate litigants uh, try to uh, work on. So that's uh, something that we're already organizing, and it's coming up in the next month or so. And then the second uh, webinar that we have in the pipeline is uh, about uh, uh, the place of the youth movement in climate litigation. We, CLX has been engaging quite systematically with uh, a variety of youth-led organizations around the world. And uh, we have found that they are interested in having more of a systemic uh, and, uh, and, and uh, intentional conversation with climate litigants. And so we will co-organize with some of them a conversation about how to better uh, integrate uh, the grassroots bottom-up action, action that uh, the youth are leading around the world and uh, the work that uh, climate litigants, climate advocates, uh, law-oriented organizations are also doing against climate change. So with that, let me introduce briefly the case that we will be uh, discussing today. Of course, we have uh, an ideal lineup of panelists, uh, so I won't give too much details. They're the experts, but I just wanted to say by way of background uh, that this case um, is, about, it's a, uh, it's about a case, it's about a project that uh, uh, concerns Royal, Royal Dutch Shell, which was slated until recently to conduct seismic surveys for oil and gas off of South Africa's wild coast, which is controversial not only for its potential to increase fossil fuel uh, supplies, but also because fossil fuel exploration and developing in this area would harm the wild coast's sensitive ecosystems and the indigenous communities who live in that area. As a result, litigators in collaboration with local communities, as we'll see in a moment, filed a suit in the High Court of South Africa seeking an interim interdict barring Shell from conducting the seismic surveying until they properly comply with community consultation obligations and other environmental law requirements. In December 2021, recently, the court ruled for the plaintiffs, finding that the relevant factors weighed towards granting the requested interim interdict. At the very least, this case has temporarily prevented Shell from surveying for new fossil fuel reserves. And depending on how the company chooses to proceed in light of the court ruling, the case may even have succeeded in more permanently protecting the wild coast from Shell's surveying activities. Crucially, this case offers important insights on how litigators and communities can work together to prevent fossil fuel infrastructure before it's brought online. And also crucially for the purposes of the types of conversation that CLX uh, um, uh, promotes, this um, litigation brings together uh, communities and uh, lawyers in sort of a, a form of movement lawyering that has a robust tradition in the Global South and South Africa specifically. And also bringing to the global community of practice uh, uh, says attention, cases that are emerging from the Global South is something that we're also keen uh, to do here. And we have a 
uh, a fantastic lineup for today's conversation. I'll introduce each of our panelists in turn as I ask them some introductory uh, prompts. And we'll begin with Melissa Groening, uh, who is an attorney of the High Court of South Africa, specializing in environmental and planning law. She is the program manager of the Defending Rights Work Stream at Natural Justice, which is a remarkable organization working across Africa with whom we've had the opportunity to partner on various uh, projects and efforts. So Melissa, thanks for accepting the invitation. Um, can you start by providing us with an overview of the arguments you made in the case and what the High Court's judgment said? Sure, thanks, Suzanne, and a very good uh, morning or afternoon to everybody that uh, joined the webinar today. I must say it's, it's not it's not very easy to summarize this case in in a nutshell because it's it's got many moving parts still to it, um, but also it started out with many parts. And so maybe I can just uh, set that out a little bit. Uh, in that there were in fact uh, two applications to the High Court to interdict Chill from continuing with its seismic surveys, and the the first one was brought was um, what the what Jill's lawyers coined it as a hyper urgent application and essentially when it became very clear that Shell intended to commence its seismic activities within the next few days we had to you know re really bring a very urgent application before the court and in in that matter we asked for um, basically relief in terms of a release where we would be given a short time frame to, to then come back to court and, and bring the evidence before the court to establish a slightly more longer term interdict. Unfortunately, we were unsuccessful in that first case, um, and, and primarily because we think that the judge failed to understand the nature of the relief we were seeking, and in fact, in his judgment, didn't provide uh, any basis for not granting the Bumisi. But at the same time, there was another application that um, we were also supporting, uh, and that was brought by a number of community applicants and community representatives on, on the wild coast of, of South Africa. And much of the argument in that case is centered around, I, I guess there's two main arguments. The first one uh, is that there was a failure to consult with those communities uh, during the, the process of obtaining that exploration right. And the second one is that it's more of a legal uh, argument that they don't hold an environmental authorization which they are required to hold. Now, this is a bit more complicated because in 2014, the legal system relating to environmental authorizations or ERAs, processes, uh, and the, the mineral rights and, and oil and exploration rights, uh, it changed to what we call a one environment system. So essentially, Shell, well, actually, it wasn't Shell, it was Impact Africa um, and uh, ExxonMobil at the time who was granted an exploration right in, in 2014 after undergoing some sort of um, although what they were for trying to say is an environmental impact assessment process but it was, it was to establish an environmental management uh, program but that was back in 2014 they were granted that and then they essentially did absolutely nothing with it that exploration right was subject to two renewals the first one was in 2017 and nobody knew about it at all and then another one uh, occurred in, in 20, or an application was made in 2020. And shortly after that, uh, right was renewed for a second time. Uh, Shell, Shell bought uh, a, a major interest in that right. So we're dealing with a number of decisions that we, we need to challenge here. And the, 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 the law remains that by the time they intended to commence their uh, seismic activities, they didn't have environmental authorization, which the law requires, despite them not have, uh, despite them having obtained an exploration right um, uh, prior to, to 20, well, in, in 2014. So not only is there a process which is very old, an environmental management program that's relied on, which is um, very outdated and really was inadequate at the time in any event, but at no time have any of these communities situated on the, on the wild coast been consulted. And, and when, when Senegal joins, I'm sure he will talk more to that as being one of those, those community members. So this was a, a real shortcoming in terms of both constitutional rights and the requirements of the law that was applicable at that time and subsequently. And of course, one of the issues with such an outdated environmental management program and exploration right is that 
since then there has become uh, there has been so much more literature a scientific literature that has become available which speaks to the impacts of those seismic uh, activities now i think we also need to draw a distinction between those impacts also on the marine environment but uh, and and then secondly uh, on the the communities own association and cultural and spiritual co connections with the oceans. And that was a, a big issue that came to the fore uh, in that case. So essentially, it was more than environmental impact. It was an impact directly on those communities who hadn't been consulted in this process. So as a consequence of that, we actually had a really good judgment that came out of Judge Blum in, in the High Court in, in Makanda, or formerly known as Grahamstown in South Africa. And the, the judge really recognized those rights of that community to be consulted, also recognizing that consultation with the king or with the, the royal household did not constitute consultation with that community. So that was really, really important. And, and certainly those rights uh, to be consulted had been severely impacted um, by not having been consulted. So because that, that first process or well, this first phase in this legal process is about interdicting and pending uh, a second decision by the court to be made on, on the validity of that exploration right that was granted and, and also on the issue of the environmental authorization. Didn't really go, the judge didn't go too much into those details, but certainly found that there was, you know, a, a prima facie right and um, prima facie case in, in relation to the 2021 renewal of that exploration right, um, uh, you know, that an environmental authorization was required and that those communities weren't uh, consulted. So we are in the second phase of this whole process where, in fact, now both of the two court cases have come together and natural justice and Greenpeace have applied to be joined to this community's case. And, and this mat and the matter will be heard on the, on the substantive aspects of the decision to, to grant the exploration right and those renewals, uh, as well as on, on the requirement to have environmental authorization. So that, that will be heard on the 30th of May. Thank you, Melissa. That was a, a very good summary of a complicated case. It's, and it's only in its early stages, but it already has all these layers. Uh, that is something that is interesting and, and exciting about this particular uh, litigation, which combines you know, arguments from environmental law, from uh, procedural rights, uh, and also from cultural rights and considerations that are usually not taken into account uh, outside of, uh, of indigenous rights people's uh, uh, litigation. So thank you for that very helpful summary. Um, Lucien, uh, natural justice works across Africa, and in fact, um, it's well known for its uh, work in the Lamu coal mine case in, in Kenya, and recently uh, in the case against the Iacob, the East Africa crude oil uh, pipeline that we also discussed in a previous webinar here uh, with the CLX community of practice. So I wanted to ask you to zoom out and give us uh, a kind of the regional context in which this specific project that's being challenged in this case is taking place. Yeah, so from the regional perspective, I mean, we know that Africa currently now is, is, is on the forefront of an explosion of oil gas projects across, across Africa. And the reason that's come through is because we know that Africa holds roughly about 8% of all the oil and gas in, in Africa. And so, of course, there's now this huge front after the recovery of the 2008 economy, plus with the issues around climate change commitments, from the various countries uh, in Africa and region and, and internationally, we know that there is huge pressures in Africa to try and, uh, as, as the oil and gas community call it, the last frontier, to try and exploit as much as you can this oil and, and, and gas deposits across Africa. And the impact of that has been quite extensive. It's impacted many local community, indigenous communities, and you know, the the ECOP case together with, with the Shell case, I mean, it's just, it's, 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 it's the start of communities trying to push back against this wave of, of, of fossil fuel projects that are now taking over Africa. And, you know, the impact of, of this case regionally is, is quite profound because it has a significant impact from the perspective that, well, we can actually defend um, successfully in court indigenous and communities' rights. 
We can um, also have fair procedural rights that need to be carefully analyzed and looked at and applied, not just you know, allow uh, a blanket approach to all oil and gas companies to come and uh, take all the reserves without undertaking any legal due process in Africa. So I think it has quite extensive value from, um, from although it was you know, an urgent case um, with a particular company, it has a significant impact regionally, particularly also the fact that it's against a large oil company, Shell, um, which we know, you know typically are, are trying to find ways to exploit as much as they can before they have any further um, court cases against them uh, in reducing their carbon footprint. So I think it's a mix, uh, it's a part of a mix of all these issues as to why um, there's this influx of oil and gas in, in, in Africa and, you know, the importance of this case, together with a couple of other cases um, currently being dealt with natural justice and other NGO um, law clinics, I think are, are quite pivotal, pivotal in trying to stop this, because once, um, if fossil fuel is able to entrench themselves like they want to, uh, the impact will be significant and, and Africa will be locked in with oil and gas for the next, you know, 10 to 20 years, which is something we're trying to avoid, you know, at, at all costs. Thank you, Lucien. And of course, as soon as I turned it over to you, I realized that I had failed to introduce you properly. It's, we're, we've been working together for a while with natural justice. So it's, I, I guess I, I feel that there's a lot of familiarity, but not to everyone here in this uh, uh, virtual event. So I'm, I'm gonna introduce Lucien uh, Limacher, as, uh, who's the head of the Defending Rights Program and litigation at Natural Justice, working with litigation teams across the African continent, as we, as we just heard. Before Natural Justice, Lucien worked as an environmental attorney at the Legal Resources Center. So I wanted to invite you both uh, next to speak to the connection with the uh, grassroots mobilization and community work. Um, a remarkable feature that I would hope that you would both um, comment on is how there was real mobilization on the ground and participation by, um, by affected communities. Uh, so maybe we can start in reverse order. Lucian, could you speak to that? And, and then Melissa? Sure. So I think one of the most powerful um, movements that, that sort of took uh, effect in, in South Africa was the Stop Shell campaign. Um, it was across the board with every demographic, um, with every community. So it was really a powerful movement from grassroots, which then allowed other organizations to join as well. And the effect of that, I think, put an incredible amount of, of pressure politically, um, which then, of course, you know, puts pressure um, internationally with, with Shell. And I think that movement, um, together with the legal strategies that we had put in place, allowed us to effectively um, deal with Shell trying to come and undertake these surveys in, in, in areas where communities would have been directly impacted because of these, because of these surveys. So I think the, the grassroots movement um, together with litigation absolutely plays a critical role in trying to build any sort of litigation at, um, um, movement in South Africa. And secondly, I think it gives, it gives an incredible amount of credence in terms of allowing communities' voices to be heard, both in an advocacy grassroots perspective, and then of course, having their rights vindicated in court, uh, you know, it's just, it, 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 it essentially puts the entire picture together when communities can actually now have their rights recognized, having them enforced in court, and, um, and, and, and of course, having their voice heard uh, across South Africa. Melissa, would you like to speak to the same question? Yeah, sure. I can just say it was this an incredible holding of hands across the country from, from coast to coast to the inland. Yeah, it, it was it was just something so culpable, actually. And, and that was in fact recognized by, by the judge in, in the first um in the first case, even though we weren't successful in that in that first. Um, uh, the, the first um, application. But what I also wanted to mention is that a sort of it, it sparked, you know, potentially there was a bit of a spark on the oil and gas industry and the public started to take notice last year. This really was just fuel to those flames and the fire of the public. And 
this is also now connected, I think, to the search of seismic case on the west coast of South Africa, and that was another seismic um, testing case that was brought in, in in January, in fact, and we already had the judgment last week that, you know, and in search of seismic was stopped from doing the, the seismic activities and, and has now put out press statements that they, they're leaving good. So, you know, this is really just a groundswell of this movement against oil and gas and, and particularly has highlighted the impacts of these kinds of activities like seismic testing, which, you know, the narrative that has come from the industry before is that this has happened for 50 years, it doesn't have any impacts, you know, we can we just go ahead and do it and nobody knows about it. Now we do know about it, we do know what the impacts are, and everybody's standing together to, to oppose it. So it's, it's really great. And I think it's also just leading to a much increase of awareness of what the uh, what detrimental impacts of oil and gas industry will have in the future as well. Thanks, Melissa and Lucien. Going back to the law for a moment, South Africa, of course, has this long tradition of uh, public interest law and constitutional progressive jurisprudence. Uh, and, um, and in fact, it's usually talked about, especially because of the jurisprudence of the Constitutional Court in the 1990s and 2000s as one of the uh, leading voices in the protection of, uh, of uh, human rights and constitutional rights uh, in the recent history. So I want, I want to ask you as a lawyer, um, how did you build on that legacy uh, of, of progressive lawyering? Uh, and I'm asked, the reason why I'm asking is because sometimes climate litigators are not necessarily steeped in the tradition of previous uh, struggles to enforce other rights. Uh, so there is there are lost uh, there are lost opportunities for cross learning and for building on what's been already been done, say in the realm of socioeconomic rights litigation, in the realm of environmental uh, uh, rights litigation, in the, realm, in the realm of indigenous rights litigation. So could you speak to that uh, interface? Mm -hmm. So this is I didn't catch you. That was full. Yeah. No, I was saying that uh, you do you manage to hear the last bit of the the question? Do you want me to repeat it? No, that's I'm happy to answer. I wasn't sure for yeah, for, for Lucy uh, or for um, myself. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Melissa, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you know what's been really, really wonderful, and it's a sort of a natural connection that's finally being made in in our jurisprudence is this connection between community rights and environmental rights. And, you know, what we're seeing also come out, you know, in, in the affidavits and in, you know, also the expert reports that this is not something new, this custodianship and interrelationship between, commu you know, communities that are relying on the, the ocean for their livelihoods that, you know, the ocean and the environment is, is, is part of who, who they are, part of culture, part of the spirituality, part of their stewardship of the ocean and the environment. And what we've had quite a bit in the past is where, so environmental law and community law has been has been butting heads a bit, you know, when there's been failure to recognize a customary law rights to, for example, to fishing or, or to um, to access resources within these proclaimed protected areas. And so it's really been wonderful to, to see how this is all coming together as naturally should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you speak to the same issue, of course, you yeah. Uh, you had experience uh, working on previous waves of uh, uh, rights uh, litigation and advocacy at uh, um, other organizations. Uh, so um, I wonder how you see this more recent wave of cases on climate in light of the uh, uh, interesting trajectory of rights uh, advocacy and litigation in South Africa. Yeah, so I mean, you know, at the advent of 1994 and 1996, when the new constitution came in, uh, a lot of the cases revolved around first generation rights and second generation rights, the so civil and political, social economic rights. And those, those, um, those rights obviously had, you know, to be ventilated and go to the constitutional court, which I think in rent, I mean, enriched the understanding of uh, community, um, or what you call Ubuntu, you know, this togetherness, this community um, um, way of, of living and thinking and breathing it and, and, and that link that it has to nature. So, you know, what, what you can typically, or what you've typically have seen is that we, we had a lot of um, 
civil and political rights in the first 10 years or so. And then after that, the socioeconomic rights um, litigation sort of came through. And those focused primarily around access to housing, access to water, access to food, access to medical treatment from an emergency perspective. And all of those, although don't have the specific um, links to environmental justice, there was always this underpinning of communities are living in abject poverty, they're living in an environment that's harmful to their health or well-being. And I think after that, a lot of connections started to be made between um, communities living in rural areas, protecting their rights in those areas, because they were, by and large, would still have access to, to, to certain um, socioeconomic rights, resources that were available, and they wanted to protect those rights. And so you slowly started to see this, this, this production, I mean, the, the, the uh, constitutional cases coming through where you had the links between environmental justice, socioeconomic rights, and civil and political rights from equality and dignity perspectives. And this has continued to grow, and we can see from, the, from recent jurisprudence, so you've got the Beleni case, which was, you know, rights to determine what you want to be built on your land. You had the Gokonso case, which dealt with fisher folk rights to access marine protected areas where they were charged for, for, for violations. And then recently, you know, the Shell cases that have come out and the Maludi case, which again dealt with access to land from a perspective of customary rights ownership of that land and I mean custodianship of that land and how the communities operate and live within that land so it's it's almost been as if this third generation of environmental rights are now taking uh taking roots in the constitutional court and they're starting to develop and making these links between civil political socioeconomic rights and environmental justice which is really great to see um and and you know I think the, the last case I'd mention is the Philippi horticulture um case which essentially dealt with the protection of an aquifer. So the large scale development that was not really gonna benefit um, poor and marginalized communities, um, natural justice together, together, together with various lawyers were able to stop that development. And a lot of it was relied on procedural issues, but that case specifically talks about aquifers, climate change, this link again, that I'm saying about third generational rights. So linking section 24 of the constitution, which is the environmental justice right in, in the South African constitution, to these other rights where we talk about community, whole community arguments, uh, customary rights, socioeconomic access to water, all of that. Thank you. Thanks for that very helpful overview to both of you. Um, and this confirms kind of the initial intuition and the initial idea behind this conversation that uh, there is a lot that's being done in countries that already had a robust tradition of community lawyering, social movement lawyering, and um, progressive jurisprudence. Uh, so uh, it's likely that we will see more developments like this one in, in countries around the, the global south that have also been at the vanguard of, say, socioeconomic rights uh, jurisprudence. Um, this is the moment where we would like to invite uh, the audience to type in your questions in, in the chat. We wanna devote the last 10 minutes or so of the panel to questions from the group, from the uh, audience. And in the meantime, uh, and also I wanted to remind everyone that we're aiming to end at around 50 uh, minutes past the hour. And then as usual, we will transition to uh, a closed door strategic conversation with the members of CLX's community of practice. And those of you who are uh, part of the community practice know that there's a separate link a Zoom link, uh, so you have to leave this meeting and then join the other one. Um, and for those of you who are not part of the community of practice, uh, we're open to new members, to new participants. So please do uh, follow the uh, instructions that we shared in the invite to this event. Um, so just for the for the last quick round of, of reactions, uh, a, a common counter argument, both in terms of, of, uh, of legal and, and, uh, and political uh, pushback against this type of case is that, well, South Africa, yes, it's a, it's a big global South country. It's an important uh, geopolitical force in, in Africa and elsewhere, but it, in the large scheme of things, it's not one of the main emitters, right? So it's not, it's not one of those countries that uh, a conventional strategic approach to litigation should prioritize and we should be going after you know global north countries and 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 the new developments happening in those countries so has this counter argument been 
uh, salient in the public debate in South Africa? And do you feel that then regardless of the question, do you feel that it has featured in any way in, in your own strategic thinking as you develop the legal arguments and also work to, uh, with communities on the, on the interface between uh, lawyering and, um, and grassroots mobilization? So let's start with uh, uh, Melissa and then uh, let's go to Sulisian. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. There's a there's a, there's a lot of a, a lot of counter arguments that I guess are being pushed primarily for political gain, and we see much of this coming out from uh, the mineral resources minister and and the department themselves. So we really have quite almost polarized politics as well uh, around this. And there's a you know even now with such a seismic leaving well, abandoning its project here, yeah, you know, it's sort of this big blame of the millions and millions of dollars that we've, you know, that this movement has costed to the country and that, you know, it's affected jobs and, and all of that. I mean, we know that it's just a spin and we know that none of that money was really coming to South Africa or South Africans anyway. So there is a lot of this that we, we are, are faced with. And, you know, I really think it's not important that we start driving those simple the simple counter arguments to those, um, you know, as part of the, the messaging around the campaign. I'll hand over to Lucien. Lucien? Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, so just also zooming out, you know, in terms of regionally in Africa, I mean, it's, you know, the, the, this argument is, well, these various arguments from the fossil fuel industry obviously impact severely and this connection that they have with governments. And I think, that plays an important role. So one of the one of the major analysis that, that needs to be done is looking at these regulatory um, frameworks where you actually get the fossil fuel industry to draft them. So you know you can see that there's this link between government, the state, and and the fossil fuel industry, um, which is obviously having a huge impact on on communities and access and access to their rights. Um, and I think that you know, to, to, to really drive home, we're going to need these pan-African organizations linking with national organizations to support one another in terms of, 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 of challenging this, this relationship and bringing in different perspectives. Um, so like, for example, in South Africa, you've got, you've got various organizations that are drafting um, uh, different alternative water policies to what you would see in government, um, which I think is fascinating, and you know, and they're going to try and push for those water policies to become law in South Africa. So it's it's bringing you know the citizens, this democracy, citizenship that that we need to see collectively across across the African continent. Because I mean, you know, we are sitting at a point now where we might have one or two or three victories, and it's a really good starting point, it's a good platform. But if that doesn't if that doesn't translate into reforming the energy sector legally from a regulatory perspective is going to be incredibly difficult uh, to continue that momentum because we know how difficult and how challenging it is to litigate i mean you've got five years sometimes even seven years um, in, in cases of litigation uh, you know we can speak about ecop it's been over a year delay for the injunction case for example you know um, so although these are fantastic um, cases and, and you know it creates this ball rolling there has to be this push on the other side where where we try and change the mentality and try and change the, the, the demand for fossil fuels so that we can really have effective uh, reduction in the CO2 emissions and start having clean energy uh, being developed in Africa. Thank you both. So my last question, and again, giving participants a last chance to chip in, usually participants are quite uh, proactive, maybe they're speechless because of the, uh, the uh, innovativeness, uh, the innovation and of the interest in this case. But uh, in, for those of you who are joining the community of practice, of course, uh, uh, Zoom room, we will be going deeper into many of the more technical legal arguments. But uh, um, I wanted to ask you both to reflect on uh, the preliminary lessons from this case. Of course, it's an ongoing case. It, it's still, you are busy um, moving forward with uh, the uh, implementation of the next stages of the litigation. But so far, if we 
pause now and try to extract some lessons of as to why the case has been successful so far and why and what type of lessons it may offer to litigants in other jurisdictions. I'd be curious to hear what uh, one, two factors uh, each of you would highlight. Uh, uh, Lucien, you wanna uh, go first? Yeah, sure. So I think um, why it was so successful is this combination of a really great advocacy campaign, a country who for all intents and purposes unite, united themselves around this particular angle and the legal arguments that were put forward before the court. So, you know, we come from an incredibly rich history in South Africa, and uh, I think all South Africans realize this, this, this connectedness that we have in community and, and community rights are, are incredibly important. And it's also an area that is currently developing in law. So I think all those three, um, I mean, all those four points allowed for the success to come through because it allowed the judge to actually look at what were the points that you know, in terms of community rights, what do we have to develop in the law in terms of the constitution when it comes to customary rights and this environmental justice aspect, which allowed, you know, of course, for us to stop shell from that perspective. So I think it was those, those four underpinnings which really assisted in, 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 in us getting victory in that case. And I'd say the most important is this collaboration from a strong advocacy, advocacy campaign and a strong legal uh, rights-based argument that, that, that was profit. Uh, from from a regional perspective, you know what what can be what can be extrapolated from that. Well, I think I think it's twofold. The one is we can actually stop exploration or early phase um, uh, activities by fossil fuel companies, which I think is incredibly powerful and important because you know quite often we get caught what, once they've done the exploration or they've undertaken the various studies that need to happen, it's incredibly difficult afterwards to, to, to stop a project once it starts going at full steam ahead. The only thing you really are uh, that you could potentially look at is some sort of rehabilitation argument uh, for the case or, or, or compensation for the community. And I think, you know, to try and stop this climate change crisis that we have, we need to stop the projects at its inception. And then the other one, I think it, it, it gives... Um, it gives, it gives um, movement to other organizations and other countries so that they can use similar arguments, um, present similar, similar reasonings in, in the papers. And I think that's incredibly powerful when you're looking particularly at regional bodies like the East African Court of Justice, ECOWAS or the African, um, um, uh, the African Court. Those are arguments that you know, they will tend to look at as well because they would be looking at all types of law that, that have developed in Africa. Lisa? Yeah, I think Lucien's uh, covered, covered it all. I would just perhaps add one thing, and that's to say just, you know, to never underestimate the importance of what one case or uh, well, the impact that one case can have. We've seen sort of the roll-on effect from, from Shell to search of seismic. We've also seen that other applications have now been delayed due to these court processes. And, I, you know, I think there's a general... And there's a, there's a general, there's much more real risk, in fact, for an investment in these kinds of projects in, in South Africa. So even if it's not strategic litigation and in, in the sort of legal definition of it, it has very strategic and important implications more than, than just the case itself. Thank you both. I wanted to, uh, before closing, I wanted to, uh, say that uh, our third panelist, Sinego uh, Wusukulu, uh, who's a South African uh, community leader, educator, and social and environmental activist with deep ties to the Wild Coast, um, had trouble connecting. He did try. He's been communicating uh, with us all along. And uh, that only exemplifies the uh, the challenges in, in working with uh, colleagues and activists on the ground who do not necessarily have the uh, broadband connection or the or the access to communications that uh, we may have in urban centers so um, with um, his he excused himself he tried to connect and we hope that in a future uh, event uh, he will be able to participate in the conversation hopefully when this case uh, reaches its final and hopefully successful stage uh, so with that, uh, 
Thanks, everyone. Thanks for Lucien and Melissa for a really uh, exciting case and a very interactive and, and um, inspiring conversation. So we, for those of you joining the private conversation of community practice again, uh, you need to join the separate uh, meeting, Zoom meeting. And for those of you who will not be joining that conversation, thanks for being here with us and, and do reach out if you wanna become part of the uh, CLX community of practice. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.